Hey, podcast listeners, I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today, I'm speaking with the well-known writer and entrepreneur, Julia Galef, about the career path that she's taken, uh, the research she's doing now, and her opinions on a whole uh, wide range of topics. We also talk about how people can pursue careers like hers, in which they try to enhance human decision-making and, and general judgment. We have a lengthy career profile on paths of just that kind, uh, slated to be released on our site in the next few weeks, so look out for that. The conversation was recorded at Effective Altruism Global San Francisco, uh, the largest annual conference for the effective altruism community. You can hear a bit of shouting in the background, but I'm sure that will only add to the ambience. If you'd like to get coaching to help you work on similar issues to what Julia is working on, that is improving human judgment, uh, our our ability to make accurate predictions and make wise decisions together, then I strongly suggest applying for free one-on-one coaching by clicking the link in the show notes or on the associated blog post. We've helped a lot of people pursue more uh, impactful careers of this this kind, and I'm sure we'll be able to uh, lead you in the right direction. As always, I recommend you get the episode on your phone rather than listening to it on your computer. You can do that by searching for 80,000 hours on whatever podcasting app you use. And now I bring you Julia Galef. Today, I'm speaking with Julia Galef. Julia is a writer and speaker focused on improving human judgment, especially about high stakes questions. Julia has been the host of the Rationally Speaking podcast since 2010 co-founded the Center for Applied Rationality in 2012, and is currently working for the Open Philanthropy Project on an, in, on an investigation of expert disagreements. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Julia. My pleasure, Rob. Good to be here. So what have you been up to this year? So uh, I have kind of a mix of projects right now. Uh, I'm doing the podcast, as you mentioned. Those come out every couple of weeks. Uh, I'm working on a book, which won't be out for a little while, um, both the podcast and the book are in various respects about improving human reasoning and judgment. Mm. Um, and then uh, the the thing that you mentioned um, with the Open Philanthropy Project is uh, this kind of independent project that I uh, conceived of and uh, and Open Philanthropy agreed to, to contract me to do. Uh, it's a part-time project. Basically, um, what I'm trying to do is host, uh, identify important questions, important in the sense that... Um, they could have a, a, a serious impact on the world. Um, like the answer to that question has a serious impact on how you try to impact the world. Um, try to identify important questions over which thoughtful, well-informed people disagree. So they have different models of the question. So for example, um, you know, is super intelligent AI something that's on the horizon or not? If it comes, is it going to be, you know, what's the probability that the outcome is going to be good or not? Um, uh, how should we be uh, dealing with the uh, housing crisis in San Francisco? Uh, is is ending mass incarceration a feasible or desirable goal? Things like that. Um, not not questions like I don't know. Is astrology real? So like questions <laughs> over which like thoughtful, reasonable people can have different models. So uh, the project is identifying those questions, um, getting to know uh, and starting dialogues with experts with different models of those questions, and then hosting conversations to try to get to the to the root, to the crux of why the experts disagree. So comparing their models, holding their models up against each other, noticing you know the areas of of overlap or non overlap, and doing this process in conjunction with a bunch of interested non-experts, especially from tech or finance or government or the media, um, people who are interested in impacting the world positively and have a a sort of disproportionate amount of resources or influence in the world but aren't experts themselves. Um, So hopefully giving them a richer and more accurate understanding of the topic um, by hearing sort of the best arguments on both sides and listening to the experts talk to each other. So have you managed to solve the problem of expert disagreement yet? Uh, <laughs> uh, I was going to say it depends on your definition of solve, but I think yeah. by any definition of solve, the answer is no. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, what, what kinds of techniques do you have, and, and are they bearing any fruit? Sure. So uh, one, te- I mean, the te- technique, the word technique is a little bit strong. Okay. Um, but one heuristic that I've been using that seems to be good is that I... I've come to think that it's important to not frame these conversations as we're trying to change each other's minds or even as we're trying to like converge and reach agreement. Um, It seems to work better to just frame the goal as let's get 
let's really understand as sort of precisely as we can what our models are and where they, dis- where they diverge from each other and why they diverge. And so the goal, the goal is framed as, uh, as understanding the landscape of the different models and not as, uh, as like shifting someone's opinion. And I think, I think that... So my current, my current hunch is that even if your goal was shifting someone's opinion, um, that this, this frame of trying to understand the models actually works better hmm. uh, than having the goal of shifting an opinion. So because you have less resistance to the idea of understanding it if, if you don't think that understanding means changing your mind? I think that's part of it. Um, I think it's also that to when you're focused on the goal of trying to change someone's mind, you end up missing a lot of important details. So you end up trying to like make arguments at them, but those arguments aren't actually going to be all that useful or relevant to them because you've missed something important about why they believe what they believe. Um, and so all of that important groundwork of like getting clarity on what their cruxes of their belief actually are, um, that groundwork seems to happen more readily when you frame the goal as you know, let's understand our respective models as opposed to let's try to converge. Hmm. Is this the same as the double crux process that, uh, that was developed at the Center for Applied Rationality? Uh, it's related to it. The double hmm. crux process is framed as hmm. trying, to, uh, trying to reach convergence. Hmm. Um, and what I'm doing is, it, it's very influenced by that. Like I talk about cruxes. I talk about trying to find... Uh, and I suppose I should define for the <laughs> listeners what a crux is. Um, a crux is a an underlying sort of belief or assumption or premise um, that is uh, is feeding into your view about the, the topic at, at hand um, and feeding in in a sort of causally important way, such that if I change my mind about this underlying thing, it would also change my mind about the higher level question. So, for example, if you know, if Rob and I uh, disagree about uh, whether it's okay to eat animals, um, a crux, like a crux might, for me, uh, might be, well, I don't actually think animals are, you know, have the capacity to suffer. If I did, then I would think it's not okay. Hmm. Like, I currently think it's fine, but if I had a different opinion about whether animals can suffer, then I would not think it's fine. So that's a crux for me. Hmm. Um, You could have different cruxes about the same topic. Like Rob's crux might be, um, uh, it's, it's wrong to cage animals, uh, like it just in principle to restrict their freedom might be another yeah, objection. or um, uh, sure, yeah, and and if uh, I'm trying to think of what could influence that, like if you thought that the animals were just as happy mm. being caged as not being caged, then you might say, well, okay, maybe it's not wrong to mm. to cage them, or maybe you think that uh, that the lives of factory farmed animals are worse have like negative utility but if you thought thought that they had positive utility maybe you would be less confident that it was wrong to, i don't know yeah. anyway so there's a lot of the, the goal though is to just sort of uh dig into the disagreement until you find um the ideally you find the double crux the thing that you know uh, you both have in common that if this thing was different then you'd both change your mind exactly so hopefully like, in the same direction yeah <laughs> Um, so that so the double crux process that uh, the Center for Applied Rationality has been, you know, tinkering with and and teaching people and practicing is kind of a more formal process that that that's related to what I'm trying to do. Um, what I'm trying to do is it's a little less formal, um, partly because I host these conversations as like dinners, mm-hmm. and I I don't. Uh, it seems to be somewhat in tension with the goal of having a convivial dinner if we've got like uh, easels and whiteboards out. Um, mm-hmm. And, and also just like my goal, like I think understanding these issues is really valuable and it's sort of my main goal, but I have this other, uh, secondary goal that's just creating, promoting a norm, uh, especially among, you know, important or influential people, uh, in these different fields, promoting a norm of being curious about important questions, um, and being uh, and seriously engaging with those questions, seriously engaging with different models of that question, and and genuinely trying to understand to reach the the best sort of most accurate understanding that you can of that question, uh, which I think is not a common norm at the moment. Mm. I think most people, you know, it's not that they're not thoughtful or smart. It's just 
you know, it, it's not it's not our default way of engaging with ideas to like try to seek out differing models and try to understand why the experts don't agree with each other. Mm. Um, so, you know, I have this kind of broader goal of creating this, this intellectual community and culture uh, among at least a subset of uh, people in these different fields, tech and finance and academia and the media and so on, um, that at least asks these kinds of questions and approaches disagreements with this spirit and so that's somewhat broader and fuzzier than, you know, reaching our double crux, uh, but I think would, would nevertheless be really valuable to achieve. So the Open Philanthropy Project only funds research if they think that it's going to be pretty damn valuable for the world. Uh, what uh-huh. kind of outcome are they, are they hoping to see? Oh, now, to be clear, I'm a contractor. Okay. I'm not, they didn't give me a grant or anything. Okay, so, right. um, but the, nonetheless. The, like, yeah, the, the, <laughs> um, the like vetting process is much less like stringent and okay. rigorous for so, contractors so than for grants. Cracks, I suppose, Basically, but. yeah, <laughs> I got in under the radar. Yeah, maybe I should become a contractor. But <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good. I recommend it. Cool. Um, but yeah, what what kinds of things w- w- are they hoping will will come out of it? Uh, I mean, I think Holden's main goal is just like get uh, get influential people to be aware of and seriously engage with questions with topics that are, if not EA, then EA adjacent. And by EA adjacent, I mean, um, uh, well, basically just what I said about important, like mm. questions that, that, that have significant bearing on, on what we should do to positively impact the world, to like reduce risks or to, um, create a lot of value, uh, and to, and I guess EA ideas more broadly, not just about object level causes like AI or you know animal welfare things like that, but sort of EA, EA memes that have to do with how you think about things mm-hmm. like the very idea of of asking yourself what would change my mind about this or the idea of you know asking about evidence or like tagging things with different epistemic status mm-hmm. or looking for cruxes um, that's it's not unique to EA but it's like it's pretty distinctive about the EA and rationality communities and I mm-hmm. think um, that that kind of way of thinking about things is something that he would, you know, that open philanthropy would love to, to be more common uh, in, you know, Silicon Valley or in the world in general. So, so is it perhaps more of an outreach project than, an, than a research project? Or is it a bit of both? Uh, I guess I wouldn't call it a research project. Um, I would call it... Uh, I don't know. I guess you could call it outreach. You could call it... You could call it community building, since okay. I, I am trying to create this intellectual community. Um, it has an element of research to it in that I'm trying to learn methods of... Uh, building good of, intellectual communities. Yes, and also methods of, um, of like finding these cruxes mm. more effectively. Like the thing, I, um, the thing I mentioned about how to frame the conversation. Um, there's a bunch of other things I could mention along those lines, like mm. kinds of thought experiments or questions that turn out to be really useful in these conversations and make the conversation more productive. Yeah. So there's an element of research to that, but it's like, you know, far from an RCT. Hmm. So on the, on the double crux process, I, um, I haven't actually tried it, but I'll uh-huh. tell you why I suspect that, uh, why I'm a bit suspicious of it, uh-huh. just having heard it described. So I feel like in life you go through and you have tons of experiences and you're just constantly kind of learning. You build up different like reference classes of different kinds of categories of mm-hmm. things. And as a result, you end up with different gut judgments, different predictions about how people are going to behave or what's going to happen if, if this is changed or that is changed. And very often, it doesn't just come down to some like single disagreement that you have about a particular, you know, if, if, if X, then A, if Y, then B. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I imagine that very often you just find people just have like different worldviews in a thousand tiny ways that through, through their life, they build up a different, a different whole perspective on, on the world with a, with a thousand little brushstrokes and like each brushstroke, no, well, no single brushstroke like makes the painting. Is that a problem that you encounter when you're trying to find these, the, these cruxes? Yeah, I mean, I, I will say it, it doesn't usually happen that there is a single double crux such that, you know, if I changed my mind about that, I would totally do a 180 on the, you know, important higher level question and same thing for you. Mm. Uh, that's pretty rare. Uh, CIFAR has usually presented the technique in that way, just in the same way that like yeah. when you're teaching an economic concept, you, you give like a simplified example, basically. Straight out, yeah. yeah, and I think, it's, I think it's a useful framework to have in your mind as you're... Mm. Um, as you're talking with someone about the topic. Uh, what 
I find tends to happen, like I'm just thinking about the last uh, such discussion that I hosted. Um, it was about uh, whether, uh, how big of a problem is it that tech companies um, can manipulate, can like, lay claim to our attention um, to the extent that they can and keep us kind of hooked on our, our devices or, or hooked on you know, a platform like Facebook, et cetera. Like we had one person there arguing that this was like a serious, um, a serious threat to human happiness and well-being and sort of a threat to the fabric of society, basically, and that it should be a cause more, uh, like taken more seriously by EAs, by their own standards. And so we were, we were kind of, you know, Debating that, I, I like to call these conversations sometimes undebates, mm. because it's it's similar to a debate in that we're discussing a disagreement that we have, um, but hopefully dissimilar to a debate in that we're like collaboratively trying to understand our respective models instead of trying to you know uh, argue or win. Mm. Um, anyway, so so to your question about like what is this process of looking for cruxes actually, what does it look like? Mm. Um, we. So we ended up identifying like three or four major cruxes such that if we believe something differently about that crux, it would at least make us less confident in our view. And they were some of them were empirical things and some of them were values. Uh, so an empirical thing was um, being less like I, for example, I was less confident uh, in the data on sh- showing a connection between uh, use of these various apps and depression or anxiety. Mm. Um, and I think if, if that evidence was really solid, I would be taking this much more seriously. And so I can just do that thought experiment. Like what if I yeah. found out this was really, really well done research, mm. um, in that world, I would like be pretty concerned about this. Like, wow, this seems like a major detriment to, <laughs> to like human well being. Uh, and like a lot of humans are affected and will continue yeah. to be affected more. Yeah. Um, and then there were these more, um, more epist- I don't even more philosophical uh, cruxes like it turned out we disagreed about what criteria to use to determine whether humans are being hurt or not and kind of a theory of value yeah basically or a theory of agency or something mm-hmm. so like my take was basically look if people self reflective if 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 you ask people, like, look, here's how much time you spend on this app. Here's the various evidence about how it impacts you. Do you want to continue spending the same, you know, amount of time? Or would you rather, you know, have, have uh, commitment devices where you could, like, tie yourself to the mask and, like, limit your Facebook use? Or at least make it a little more difficult for you to use Facebook or something. If you gave people that information and they said, like, nope, I'm fine doing what I'm doing. I don't want to limit my access. Then I would call that, you know, people are not being hurt by this. Or, like... Mm-hmm. At least I would not be willing to what, what claim they, that people are being hurt. But what if they said in the moment that they were suffering while it was happening? <laughs> you, I guess uh, that, that you just I think, think that's that, very unlikely. Um, I, I guess I think it's unlike. I, I think it's unlikely that they would say they're suffering in the moment and still endorse mm. it. Yeah. But if they did endorse it, then I would say like I guess maybe I'm more of a preference utilitarian okay. or something yeah. uh, than a hedonic u- utilitarian. Mm. Um, whereas my. Uh, uh, this other guy at the dinner who had been sort of making the strong case for why this problem was really important felt that, look, people are sort of too, we've all been too corrupted uh, to by even, this oh. thing to, we have like false consciousness, false, basically. I was about to say false consciousness. Exactly. Yeah, that's it's the like word, a that's Marxist the analysis of, at dinner. of uh, Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he was like, you know, we just can't, we, can, we can't really imagine what it would look like to have lives in societies that weren't so dominated by technology, and so oh. we have nothing really to compare this to. Maybe the 13-year-olds can't, but I can remember not <laughs> having Facebook. It wasn't that Fair, long yeah. ago. How old am I? <laughs> anyway, so yeah, that's... But that was the theory. I yeah. suppose at some point people won't be able to remember the, fe- the, pre, the pre-social media right, era. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, so that, that was, um, that was yeah. a more philosophical more crux. Philosophical. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you said earlier that you're writing a book. Uh, is this something that you think more people should do to, to, to get their ideas out there? Should, <laughs> should, should, should I be writing a book? I, I wouldn't mind having written a book, but I'm less sure about the process of actually writing one. I feel you there. <laughs> <laughs> As someone in the throes of it, I definitely yeah. feel you. Um, I, you know, the thing that I think books do really well um, is provide a nice sort of container for for a thesis or ideas 
such that it's easy to spread and talk about. Um, And they do this better than blog posts for the most part. So even if, like I've, I've heard people sometimes say, you know, most books should be blog posts or something, or most books should be articles or something like that. And I, I sympathize with that view. Most podcasts should be movies, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I sympathize with that view. Um, Although, you know, even if there is a lot of padding in books, I think padding and redundancy can actually be good for, for uh, making content stick and, and like impact people. So I'm less, I'm less, you know, annoyed by, uh, by padding in books than some people are. Mm. Um, but, but even if, even if you could have expressed the same point in a blog post, having a book for whatever reason with like a certain title that's, that's like, uh, been sort of added to the list of like books about this topic and it's, you know, been written up in some articles, et cetera, it makes it just part of a public conversation Mm. in a way that's really hard to do with, you know, even if you write a ton of blog posts on a topic, uh, and it'd be like, you know, what would be a good example? Um, I don't know, guns, germs, and steel, or... Uh, really stakes out some territory. Yeah, it's got like a, you know, it's a very long book with lots of detail, but it's got kind of a thesis, and it's, as you say, guns, germs, and steel, and even if someone hasn't read it, if they've heard about it, they sort of know the concept, and it it provides this nice little handle for a, for a point of view or a thesis that makes it easy to talk about and makes people want to talk about it. And that's something I think books can do really well. Hmm, Okay. Well, if I, if I, all, all now I need, I guess, is an idea for actually what to write about. And I could <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> go ahead. Also and, the hard uh, part. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you, you do quite a lot of different outreach activities uh, with your ideas. So you've got the Rationally Speaking podcast mm-hmm. uh, that you've been doing, I guess, for, for seven years now. Over seven years now, yeah. Uh, how, how, how do podcasts compare to, compare to books, C- compare, to, compare to Snapchat, so... <laughs> well, well, I guess, yeah, I guess I you tweet as well. Had today all those, <laughs> snapping their chats, their ideas. Or, and yeah, <laughs> I don't understand big on... what that's all about, but <laughs> so I hear. Um, so, how do podcasts compare yeah, to I other? Mean, has media? it been a, has it been a good vehicle for sharing your ideas? It really has. Um, I I didn't have any particular grandiose plan when I started it, mm. but uh, but I've been really happy with how it's gone so far. Um, I have been. So, so, you know, I, obviously I try to pick guests who I think have interesting things to say and are doing interesting work that, you know, deserves more attention and so on. But underlying it all, the the purpose of the podcast or like the driving force behind the choices that I'm making for the podcast is really promoting this approach to epistemology that I, uh, that I support and that I wish were more common. Mm. Um, and so the kinds of questions that I'm always trying to ask and the stuff that I'm most interested to, to talk to the guests about is stuff like, you know, what counts as good evidence and how, how confidently can we know things? Um, and what are the kind of standards of this field? Uh, and how good can they be? How, how, like, how much knowledge could we possibly have um, with, with confidence about questions like the one you're studying? Things like that. Um, and I, when I can, I, I really like to get to this point in the conversations with the guest where they're thinking on, they're thinking in real time, basically, um, about like the implications of their research or the, you know, epistemic status of their claims, things like that. Um, because I wish that people thought in real time more often, as opposed to just kind of regurgitating cached things that they've, you know, said again and again in different contexts or uh, that they, like, have heard and, you know, think you're supposed to say or supposed to think, uh, not to sound too, you know, arrogant or anything, <laughs> to, like, criticize all modern communication <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, yeah, I think we all do that from time to time. Yeah. The question is just the balance. It's yeah. not terrible. I no, just wish no. that they're on the margin. I think it would be good for our, like, collective epistemic health uh, if people if people spent more time talking about and thinking about things where they don't have a cached answer yeah. um, and, and are trying to think on the spot. So those are, those are the kinds of like practices and questions that I am trying to use my podcast to, um, to promote. Hmm. How many people did you end up reaching? Oh, like what's the reach yeah. of my podcast? Uh, I think now a typical episode gets about 35,000 listeners. Wow. Um, occasionally one of my episodes will, uh, get a lot more than that, like around a hundred thousand, but that's Mm. relatively rare. 35,000 is more like the modal number. Yeah. 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 Um, so it's really, yeah, it's quite a lot given the amount of, uh, the effort that goes into a podcast isn't, isn't that large. Uh, You can, you know, do it in a day. Uh, 
Yeah, and, although, it's like, and then it's like speaking to an enormous uh, auditorium, yeah. Yeah, well, no, I guess like a sports stadium, really. <laughs> yeah, I guess, wow, it's kind of fun <laughs> to visualize concretely uh, my audience. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they, you know, they tend to be like smart and thoughtful people. Like based, based on the mm. comments I get or the emails I get, the people I talk to on Twitter. Um, and also, so I've been, I've been running ads for GiveWell in the last few months, mm. and... Uh, and Givel has told me that a uh, they've also tried running ads on other podcasts mm-hmm. or other platforms, and a disproportionate amount of the mm-hmm. donations they've gotten have come through my podcast, which makes yeah. me feel very proud of my audience. Yeah, I you know? you, yeah you've taught your audience well. Exactly. To, to, to or, or chosen them well. It's hard to, hard to <laughs> yeah, distinguish. Yeah, yeah. Let's be skeptical. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, this podcast is also also new, but I've uh, generally found that if the, the the longer the content, the better the comments uh, become, or at least like mm. the, oh, the harder it is to access the people, right? Who because are... I think that a lot of people, the worst responses tend to come to people who've read the headline or maybe only the first few words of the right. headline sometimes. But if if they have to actually go through and listen to like uh, you know a whole hour of conversation in order to get to something semi outrageous that someone said, <laughs> it's a lot harder for them to get right, right. to yeah respond just, just to that. Increase the cost of of trolling. Mm. or outrage exactly yeah speaking of the uh horrors of uh social media and uh, people being annoying online <laughs> you're also quite a big star on, on twitter uh oh and, i don't uh, know yeah. if i'd go that far but i've definitely <laughs> been ramping up my use of it and, yeah. and i like twitter i'm, wow, I'm like a okay. fan of it <laughs> yeah. it's, it's it's dystopian it's, it's dystopian like, yeah. i just don't i mean look I've, I've heard i've heard the complaints about it hmm. um i've and I don't really doubt them. I don't mm. doubt that people have really bad experiences on Twitter. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my experience has just been great. I, I, I just find it like, okay. you know, the comments that I get are, you know, they're not all great comments, mm. but they're mostly like sincere and engaged. And sometimes they're like really thoughtful and interesting. Um, mm. There's just so many interesting people on Twitter. Like there are all these social scientists um, who have conversations in real time with each other in public that we can all mm. listen to and comment on about like just the latest papers or the or debates in social science like like this this uh, move to to lower the p value threshold to yeah. like point zero zero five I think it was yeah. it's just really cool to be able to yeah. see these conversations between experts yeah. uh, about a thing that they actually disagree about in real time and I. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's true. I can sing I, I, the praises of Twitter much yeah. longer if you let me. So, uh, I guess I can't hate it that much because I read it every day. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm just kind of stuck in this is, trap, I suppose. I guess yeah. this is evidence against my belief that uh, yeah. if, if someone is consistently unhappy doing something, <laughs> yeah, um, then they will choose to think, limit their access to it. And you're like evidence against that. I suppose it depends what what bubble you're in. I, I mean, people are usually fairly uh, friendly to me, but then when I read other people's threads, it's got you've got someone you know <laughs> smart saying something very reasonable, and then yeah. you just read the the responses and. It'll be like I don't know Stephen Hawking's like view on quantum physics, and then you just blow. You have like I just finished high school, but my view on quantum <laughs> physics is uh, yeah, it's a bit <laughs> it's frustrating. Although like yeah. cons- perpetually amusing, I suppose. Amusement um, is or like I guess bemusement is yeah. is a an attitude I strive for yeah. um, as a substitute for like indignation and outrage okay. and frustration. Yeah, um, I don't always succeed, um, but I don't know I. It's not that I don't also get really irritated by mm. people sort of misunderstanding, sometimes seemingly willfully misunderstanding mm. my points or other people's points. Um, I just try to keep in mind that communication does seem to be really hard. Mm. and most Especially of those, with only 140 characters at a time. Yeah, I got to say that um, the character limit is... There's some advantages to it. It has forced me to like be much more concise and to the point than I otherwise would. Um, and it's kind of funny to... like. I had this one blog post I'd written that was like four paragraphs. And then I realized, wait, I could literally just write this in 140 characters and I wouldn't lose that much. Mm, um, so yeah. that's, that's kind of a good thing. But it does have this downside of, you know, there's some things you really just can't say in 140 characters. And so you have to like do these strings of tweets and like it just gets so messy. Really does not feel optimal um, yeah. in that way. But So wh- what have you learned about um, communication from either being on Twitter or doing the podcast? Oof. Um, I would say, uh, well, I'm like continually adding to my stock of, of ways that people can misunderstand mm. topic X or topic Y. Um, and I think one, one thing that I didn't appreciate enough when I started out writing blog posts or doing interviews, et cetera, um, is that it's not enough to just 
like if you're worried about people, you know, misunderstanding you and thinking you're saying X, it's not enough to just add a sentence in your interview or in your blog post or whatever that says, by the way, I'm not saying X. Um, people will still think you're saying X and yeah, respond angrily time. as if you did. Yes. Um, and, you know, maybe some of that is sort of they're being intentionally, they're like intentionally misinterpreting you, but a lot of it is just, you know, people don't read super closely. So they may like miss or not quite parse that line. Like if, if they're going in to, with the assumption, the expectation that you, you believe X, then I think it's just kind of easy for the human brain to like reinterpret that your, your mm. line so, so that it doesn't quite have the corrective impact that mm. you expect it will. Yeah. Um, and they also, you know, it's been helpful for me to model this process as people having priors about what you believe. Um, and, and not it, reading it carefully. And, and not, well, yeah, so they're not reading it carefully is like a separate problem. Mm. This, this other problem is they have priors about what you believe and you can give them evidence that will try to budge them away from those priors. Mm. But if the priors are strong, you often need a lot of evidence to budge them from mm. those priors. Uh, like you have to not only say, like let's say, let's say I made a post about um, criticizing some government intervention mm. for being ineffective. Um, they may pattern match me to like, oh, she's probably a libertarian. She like hates government, whatever. And, uh, and, that, and that may not be wholly irrational either because often it is the case that, you know, mm. people who criticize government programs are like statistically much more likely to be libertarian than people who don't criticize government programs or something mm. like that. Don't anchor too hard on this one example. Sure. But yeah. um, uh, so they have this like assumption about me and I can say like, it doesn't mean that all government programs are bad, but if I just have that one kind of, paltry sentence that might not update them that much from suspecting that deep down I really hate government I might have to give stronger evidence like saying more sort of sincere positive things about examples of government programs that I think were effective mm. um and just like spending more time uh and like emotionally salient content mm. budging them from their assumption from their prior that I hate government mm. um so so that was one major lesson for me was uh was realizing that I can't just like yeah. say I don't support X and cause people to believe, okay, she doesn't support X. Yeah. Um, and also that like, that like they're not being completely irrational if they have a prior about what I believe mm. based on what kind of people tend to say what so, I say, you know, that makes sense. Um, did you find ways to make the podcast uh, more popular over time, like adjusting the <laughs> format or changing your hosting style? It's I'm asking of, for a friend, of course. Uh, <laughs> to be honest, I've done embarrassingly little optimization. Okay. Um, you know, for, for a podcast that's been around over seven yeah. years, um, <laughs> I... You just yeah. talk to people. I, I mean, I'm, I'm mostly just doing what I, what I enjoy mm. um, and sort of shrugging and being like, well, whatever audience I get from the thing I'm, mm. I enjoy, great. Uh, and I'm like very pleased that it's, you know, as large as it is. Mm. Uh, I'm sure, however, that's not like a defense of not optimizing. Like <laughs> I could optimize some and I think, yeah. thing, I think I would still be doing things that I enjoy, uh, maybe just as much, but like maybe appealing to more people. So mm. I keep kind of vaguely thinking like, yeah, I should really, uh, I should really like do more research on, how to improve podcasts or make them more widely appealing. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have some ideas. I have like ways, think, like experiments that I want to try uh, with the podcast yeah. that, you know, I could like experiment and see what sticks. That was some good caveating. I, I was about to patent match you to people who just hate optimization. <laughs> but, uh, you, you've, you've convinced me. I've updated away from that. <laughs> so uh, you spent some time in academia earlier in your career, right? And then you decided that it, that it wasn't the right fit for you? Uh, a little how did that come time. About? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I spent one year in a PhD <laughs> okay. in economics before dropping out, right. uh, if that counts as being in academia. Yeah. <laughs> um, although I also, I was a research assistant for mm. several years before that um, to, to various social science researchers at mm. Columbia, uh, when I was an undergrad and then uh, MIT and Harvard after I graduated, I spent a year at the National Bureau of Economic Research as a research assistant mm -hmm. and then a year at Harvard Business School um, writing case studies on international economics mm -hmm. um, for a professor there. So I have some experience with academia aside mm -hmm. from my one, you know, my like abortive <laughs> foray into uh, a doctorate. Um, so uh, why did you decide uh, not, not to go down that route? Because it seems pretty close to what you're doing. Um, 
Yeah, it was, I mean, so the, the one year wasn't, it wasn't like a sudden turnaround after one year where I was like super pumped and then I, yeah. you know, quit after one year despite that. I'd, I'd kind of, by, by the point I started the PhD, I'd kind of started um, having doubts about whether this was the right career track mm. or field for me, um, but I thought like, you know, I, sh- I should give it a shot anyway now that I've come this far because I'd like spent my undergrad studying statistics and doing research for professors with mm. the idea that I would go into academia. I'd already put a lot invested into it. So I didn't want to give up too quickly. Um, but the, the reasons for leaving, I mean, they were both personal and kind of intellectual or ideological. The personal reasons were just, I I think I really am a generalist by nature. Like I've optimized my career so far for getting to spend as much time like thinking and talking to people about a wide variety of interesting and important topics. And I love that. Uh, and it's really hard in academia to, yeah. to do stuff like that. Like, I guess until you're sort of really tenured and you can just be a dilettante, mm-hmm. uh, you have to be really narrow um, and detail oriented. Uh, so there were there were the personal reasons, um, and then the the ideological or intellectual reasons were, you know, this was this was before the replication crisis hit, mm-hmm. um, like a few years before, but nevertheless, I had sort of noticed a bunch of these problems with social science methodology, not, not just completely of my own accord. Um, you know, I like talked to people who had really, who were really discerning about research methodology, who like had concerns and, you know, I'd seen, I, you know, there were some specific papers where I, I had kind of inner knowledge into the workings of how that paper was put together. And it was yeah. like seeing the sausage being made. Yeah. Um, like I remember talking to one professor who described how they had they had run some like mini surveys ahead of time to figure out which wording of their question would be most likely to get the results that they wanted in the main study that they actually published. And they like, did they like felt no compunctions about doing this or telling me about it. Like, do I and really so, want to enter this corrupted yeah, industry? And like, that's not to say that there isn't good research being done or that I couldn't have chosen to do good mm-hmm. research if I'd really tried, but it felt like the deck would be stacked against me. Yeah. Um, if the incentives are, or like if if you get rewarded for publishing a lot mm-hmm. and trying to be like a stickler for research quality makes it harder to get published, then it felt like, you know, academia is all, already really hard and competitive and this would be like making it even harder on myself. Do I really want to do that? You know. Yeah. Uh, so you've had a kind of unconventional career since then. It seems like you've been kind of making <laughs> your own future, like starting your own projects. Basically. And, uh, jumping yeah. from thing to thing. Is, yeah. is that a path that you would recommend? Guess, well, yeah. has, it, has it felt risky at any point? I mean, I've been fortunate in having like friends and family who I could live with or, you know, my, my parents gave me like some monthly stipends after I left grad school when I didn't have a job. Uh, you know, this isn't something that everyone gets to do. I, yeah. I'm definitely lucky and I recognize that, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and that was it was super helpful to have that cushion of you know, at least a couple years when I didn't have to be like really supporting myself in New York City fully. Um, and I could just explore and meet people and learn about different opportunities and so on. Um, I, I think that one like generalizable piece of advice, even if you can't, you know, do exactly what I did, uh, is to, as much as is feasible for you, just spend a lot of time getting to know like interesting and smart people working on cool things. Uh, and even if you can't predict exactly how that will end up benefiting you, I, I have like decent confidence that it will in some way. Those just, those connections are how you hear about cool opportunities that, you know, aren't public uh, or that's how you like end up finding people to work with uh, on something that wouldn't have occurred to you if you hadn't known them, that kind of thing. That, that's been really useful to me in the long run. So obviously one of the key decision points was deciding to leave your PhD. Have there been Mm -hmm. other kind of crossroads that you've been at where you had really hard career decisions to make? Um, (laughs) Honestly, looking back at all of the um, shifts, or I don't know about all, certainly a lot of the career shifts that I've made or shifts in like my plans or how I've been thinking about my career, they've mostly been epistemological in some way. Like I mentioned the econ one where I was, you know, nervous about the quality of research. Um, uh, when I was in college, uh, this would be like an early example. I, I switched from a, I was going to be a political science major um, and then switched to 
uh, economics and then switched to statistics. And basically, I just uh, I was very interested in questions, the questions that political science studies, uh, but then just got frustrated with the lack of rigor in answering them, which is not entirely because political scientists aren't rigorous people. It's they're just very hard questions to get rigorous answers to because, you know, you can't really run RCTs on countries uh, or like rerun history, um, which is unfortunate. Uh, so that was one. There was also this, I, I tend to gloss over this period of my career just because it like makes for a more complicated mm. story. But I did spend like a year and a half thinking I was going to uh, go into urban design and architecture. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> I don't talk about it that much. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Google my name. You can find stuff I've written for Metropolis or the wow. Architects newspaper. Um, when was or, this? Uh, it was 2000. Nine, two thousand eight, something wow. like that. Okay, recently. Oh, well, recently. I, I mean, <laughs> like nine years ago. What, but what yeah. was you thinking there? Um, this was right after I left my PhD, um, and I was just, you know, ex- basically my plan was I'll be a freelance journalist as a way to uh, to like learn about cool stuff being done, mm. um, and and so you know some of the freelance writing opportunities I was uh, able to find were about urban design and urban planning and architecture. And I've always kind of been drawn to subjects that are about complex systems and complex systems interacting with each other mm-hmm. and like making complex systems work better. This was kind of what drew me to economics uh, and uh, urban design and So you don't mean planning. visual design. You mean like thinking through the social science and economics of how you lay out a city or organize its transport. I, I guess I, I, mean, I mean all of those layers. Like there's definitely a physical design layer, uh, like the it was pretty cool, actually, to think about how f- the physical design of a downtown or the physical design of, you know, a waterfront or a park or, or campus or something can make the space work better, um, either, like, work better socially, like, cause cause people to have better social interactions in that space or make it work better economically. Um, so those were... It was just cool to think about the intersection between physical design and, you know, economics or psychology. Um, unfortunately, the the rigor in those fields is also not that great. Uh, and I think partly that's because, you know, designers tend to go into those, like, ask those questions. And, you know, designers, people who go into design are usually not the same people who are, like, super interested in really rigorous social science methodology. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, again, it's kind of hard to do uh, experiments about a downtown of a city. So uh, that was sort of why I ended up shifting into science journalism um, because scientists loved to answer questions like, how do you know? And like, what evidence are you using? And when I would ask those questions of designers talking about their projects, uh, they like didn't, they were like confused or put off about me asking the question or they would give an answer that was like kind of orthogonal to what I was asking. (laughs) Why aren't all these designers just obsessed with impact evaluation? I know. (laughs) (laughs) I don't really fault them. It's just not really their thing, but yeah. So looking, looking back, say, to um, when you graduated from high school, are there, are there any other paths that you wish you might have per- pursued earlier on? Like, I don't know, running for political office? Or... Mm. Running for political office sounds horrifying. I, don't, <laughs> I, I was want kind other of teasing people to do there, it. Right? <laughs> uh, are there other... Pa- I mean, yeah. you know, I, it's easy to look back and wish that I had done things sooner or like not taken random detours into architecture and urban design um and but all it like but but you're not you don't look back with regret that you didn't you know commit yourself to dentistry or something uh no I mean my my life right now is just pretty amazing Mm -hmm. by my standards like I really I remember someone asking me back in, I don't know, 2007 or something, whenever I dropped out of my uh, PhD, like, well, what would you ideally like to do? And I said, honestly, I would like to spend as much of my life as possible just talking to smart and interesting people about important things. Like, that would be great. Mm. And that's not like a defined career path, but I feel like I basically do that now. Mm. You know, I have the podcast, um, I give talks sometimes, and this project for Open Philanthropy uh, for the Open Philanthropy Project involves having interesting and important conversations with smart and thoughtful people. And I'm like doing the thing I wanted to do. It's hard to, you know, hard to imagine it being that much better <laughs> for me by my standards. Um, do you think you ended up in a good place in part because you explored so widely? You tried so many different things? and 
it is so hard for me to to have conclusions about like why to the extent that I succeeded at my goals so far why is that I it's really yeah. hard to speculate you don't want um, to generalize I mean the one thing that I said earlier is something that I'm decently confident in that like like if I look at at the opportunities that I got that helped me progress to where I am now they they seem to be because I just like met a lot of smart and cool and thoughtful people working on important things and and ended up getting opportunities I wouldn't have gotten if I didn't have that network of of friends basically Mm. Uh, so I do think that's good advice for people in general uh, who aren't already confident about what they want to do and have like a clear path to follow Broadly speaking, the problem that you're working on is improving like human judgment and, and reasoning. And it seems like one of the places that this would be uh, most valuable, valuable would be in kind of uh, higher tiers of government or other kind of influential institutions like the, like the World Bank or perhaps the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, how feasible do you think it is that like some of the research that, that you're involved with or aware of or that people like Philip Tetlock are doing on forecasting mm-hmm. could could actually be applied to significantly improve the way that decisions are made in these uh, you know important institutions. I mean, I think it would be amazing if uh, if legislators or or you know policymakers were really training their judgment to you know improve their ability to be calibrated to like have practice best practices of like questioning their own judgment or, or like, like seeking out people who disagree with them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, unfortunately, I think most of the problem comes down to incentives. And if you as, you know, if, if you as a congressperson, uh, for example, are, don't get rewarded for your accuracy, then it's, you know, just going to be really hard to get you to try to improve your accuracy. Um, well, I mean, most members of Congress, like 90% or something, are re-elected every year. So a lot of them just aren't in that much danger. It's, it's supposed to be a bit surprising that they don't use the fact that they have very high re-election rates too. I mean, they've in a sense got quite a lot of discretion there. They could like vote for things or against things that they, they don't like, to maybe, maybe more than they do. Uh, and they could just, you know, mouth off and just actually express their true opinion and try to be reasonable. And uh, like some of them would lose their seats, but, you know, many of them would then get to actually do what, do what they believe. I don't actually know um, how uh, how insecure Congress people should feel mm. about their uh, their seat, and maybe they like feel more insecure than they should, or something. I, I but I just don't see an active force pushing them yeah. to be more active. Like, like let, so. Let's say they um, let's say they knew, knew their seat was secure, and they were well intentioned and really did want to like pass the best policies yeah. for the country. Um, they still like the impact of your decisions is so like long term and uncertain. So it's like really kind of hard to tell if you made the right choice or not. Uh, and you get, you get like adulation or disapproval in the short run based on whether your choice seems good or not. And so it, it just seems like my, my rule is basically anytime the, benefits of accuracy are uncertain and in the future and the costs of trying to be more accurate are paid up front in terms of like effort or unpopularity um there's going to be a really strong uh pressure to against accuracy yeah i guess the kinds of people who tend to get elected are probably not the most intellectually fastidious people and i think i was also probably true and while it's true that most of them are re-elected when it comes to congressional elections each two years, so they also run the risk of getting primaried if they stick out too much. So they're, they're, their mm. own party could vote to not nominate them again. Right, yeah, the primary step complicates yeah. things a bit. Yeah, so like, has your personal experience given you much insight into you know, like what places it might be possible to get more reforms? Are there, are there some institutions that are more open to, to changing how they think about things and trying to become more rational? Well, uh, the intelligence community has has seemed quite interested in this, and in fact, IARPA, uh, which is the so 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 IARPA is like sort of a newer spinoff of DARPA, mm. um, uh, where DARPA is, is funding research that 
um, could produce innovations helpful to the defense community, to the military, and IARPA is doing the same thing, but for the intelligence community. Um, so they've been, uh, it, it's uh, run by Jason Matheny, and he's, he was actually the one who funded uh, Phil Tetlock's work on, on forecasting that eventually got turned into the book Super Forecasting. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, Jason's all about, like, epistemic oh. rigor <laughs> and, uh, and accuracy. Yeah, both, both Jason and Philip Tetlock have, a, have agreed to come on the podcast oh, at wonderful. some point. So, so ho- hopefully great. we'll be able to find a time soon oh, to, to talk great. to them about that. Um, but, yeah. Okay, and so the intelligence community, uh, is, do you mm-hmm. think that can be explained by the incentives being good for the, for the bureaucrats there? Oh, well, so I don't actually think... Um, I don't actually think that the current intelligence community or, or the intelligence community historically is that incentivized to be to try to improve their accuracy. Yeah. Um, and if you look at the kind of forecasts that people in the intelligence community make, they're, they're often sort of hedgy and, you know, they're not the kind of thing where you could really tell if the person was right or wrong. Um, but uh, I guess the reason that I named the intelligence community is for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, because there just happen to be people like Jason uh, who are who are working on changing the incentives um, by you know experimenting with forecasting tournaments and things like that. Um, and two, because uh, it at least seems like in the intelligence community there are fewer disincentives for accuracy than there are in many cases that like. Mm-hmm you know, you're not, like, I don't know, if you're, if you're a pundit You, you don't have to something. appeal to the general public. Yeah, yeah you don't, um, people aren't pressuring you to, to be uh, either, you know, really sort of mainstream appealing and likable. They're not pressuring you to be contrarian and, you know, super original in your ideas. Um, so at least in the absence of those pressures, I think there's, like, more hope for, for, uh, instituting new norms of accuracy. Hmm. Are there any other places that you can think of where there's been progress made? I mean, it seems like hmm. taking a longer term view, people are more reasonable than they were 200 years ago. So, like bit by bit, uh, the quality of you know discourse in public has, has mostly been improving. Perhaps the last few I years think... doesn't look so good, but yeah, you're comparing would... to 200 years ago. Yeah, I'm just thinking. Uh, like what what we read today from those times is kind of the most outstanding work by by the very brightest people. Are you talking but about like kind of, comparing the best to the best, or about the oh no, median no to the more median. the median to the median? Yeah, I'm thinking just just people are a lot more educated now, and yeah, you're not even convinced that things have gotten more reasonable. That's that's very interesting. No, I mean, certainly we we know more now, so we know more science. Um, I think the U.S. has always been... So I guess I'm just thinking about the U.S. now to keep yeah. it simple, a simpler. Uh, the U.S. has always been pretty strongly anti-intellectual. Mm. Um, but it... Okay, so in, in one sense, um, we're maybe more reasonable in that like there's more scientific knowledge than there was before. Mm. Uh, in another sense, I feel like we're less reasonable in that... Uh, the way topics are discussed is more linked to entertainment value and sensationalism than it used to be. Hmm. Um, and from what I've read, we're also more polarized. Hmm. And so, and, and like the more polarized you are, the harder it is to have reasonable discussions because hmm. you sort of, you know, I- instinctively uh, react against whatever people like quote unquote on the other side are saying. It maybe we're more reasonable now. Hmm. It's not a clear slam dunk answer to me. Yeah. I guess it would it would be quite hard to answer this definitively because you'd have to find a way of you know randomly sampling a bunch of discourse today and a, yeah. a bunch of discourse I mean, from 1820 at, and maybe you could look at newspaper like yeah, like newspaper opinion like pages like, or something of newspapers from yeah, those years yeah, and judge them yeah interesting okay well I'll, I'll see if I can find if anyone's actually uh, yeah, looked into cool. that that would, be, that would be a cool thing to find out it I, would. I suspect it hasn't been looked at but. Um, okay, so maybe on the broader scale, we're not getting more reasonable, but are, are, there, are there any uh, any lights of hope uh, other than the intelligence community? Well, I'm pretty happy with what's happening in the social sciences. Yeah. I mean, in, this, in a bunch of scientific fields, so I've just been paying attention more to the social sciences. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the replication crisis is, is depressing in one sense to realize that, that a large fraction of studies don't replicate and that things like like p hacking or sort of statistical like like 
misapplications of a statistical test just, you know, universally throughout a particular field um, in a way that, like, really impacts the, the, the truth of the results. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that is really common, and finding that out in the replication crisis has been depressing a bit. But I, I feel like I've seen attitudes changing just in the last, like, two years even, mm-hmm. um, that, that, that there's much more sort of, like pro-openness, pro-rigor, um, anti-p-hacking attitudes being espoused now than there were even two years ago. Um, I don't know if this n- next thing I'm about to say is true, but I, I at least heard a rumor that in um, in like job interviews um, or, or when deciding whether to hire someone um, to a research role, to a professorship, um, people like are starting to look at stuff like, do they share their data? Do they like pre-register? Things like that. Um, we now like pre-register our... our um, uh, medical studies, that's been really good. So there's a lot of sort of maybe feeling like we're worse off because we're uncovering problems that had always been there and, and they're now visible when they weren't before. But from what I can tell, like a large fraction of scientists, maybe the majority of scientists re- like really want to fix this problem and are sort of spending a lot of cycles uh, doing so. So that's, that's cool. And as long as they don't have to totally ruin their careers in order to do it, then they'll... Yeah, I mean, along. yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, you know, step even by if step. you, yeah, like if if you care about something, you, you'd have to care about something quite a lot to be willing to sort of pursue it, even at the expense of your own career. Mm-hmm. I think most of us humans are maybe not quite that altruistic, yeah. um, but you only need some amount of altruism to get a lot of progress collectively. So there's a lot of different ways that people could try to tackle the general problem of human rationality and irrationality. Mm-hmm. Are there any kind of paths of study or work that you'd particularly like to highlight? Like fields that someone could go into or questions yeah. they could pursue? Someone was 20 and they're listening to this and they're thinking, I really like Julia Gaylor for like what she's doing. You know, what, what should they study ideally? And you know, where might they go, go to work once they graduate? Or is it just you have to be an eclectic public intellectual who dabbles <laughs> in lots of different topics no, and tries no. every job? <laughs> no, no. Um, I mean, so I think it would be great. I, there's been you know a lot of research into irrationality, into heuristics and biases. Um, this is the kind of thing that that uh, Danny Kahneman and Amos Tversky won the Nobel Prize for mm. a few years ago. Um, there hasn't been a ton of research on uh, interventions, like realistic interventions that might help improve judgment. Uh, Phil Tetlock is, is kind of one of the few exceptions to that. Other than that, like, so I would say the amount of research on debiasing or improving judgment is, is, I don't know, maybe an order of magnitude smaller than the amount of research demonstrating the existence of judgment flaws. Um, and even within that, that, uh, subset of research about debiasing, most of the interventions are uh, that I've seen are pretty small scale. They're like, if we tell someone about this bias, do they demonstrate it in you know a contrived experiment in the lab that day? Which is a far cry from like, can we improve someone's judgment in a lasting way that impacts real life decisions that they make for their life um, or their career? And the reason, of course, that that is such you know so rarely studied is that it's a very expensive thing to study. You need these long term studies it's hard to it's hard to like test things in in real life in a naturalistic setting as opposed to in a nice simple contrived lab experiment um but but that is the kind of research that i think we actually need um to you know have any shot at like uh, like a a really rigorous base of knowledge about improving judgment Hmm. so that that's the kind of research i would love to see someone do in academia or alternatively fund as an independent funder because, you know, again, the incentives are somewhat stacked against you if you're trying to get a lot of papers published as a young scientist. Hmm. So the natural things to study, I guess, would be psychology or economics or some other kind of social science. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I guess technically the kind of studies I'm talking about could be done in a bunch of different discipline or departments. It could be done in economic, like behavioral economics or cognitive science, um, uh, maybe a few others. Uh, but maybe business, I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I, I think to like get a feel for the, the, the landscape of topics and what, what interventions would be promising enough to try, I think uh, studying yeah, behavioral economics and cognitive science is probably what you want to do. Hmm. 
So you've talked about IAPA and uh, Philip Tetlock. Mm-hmm. Uh, are there any other like really outstanding research uh, groups that you could join if like, once you'd skilled up later on in your career? Hmm. Sounds like it's I mean, a fairly small and affected <laughs> area. <laughs> well, I mean, research groups is tough. I can like think of particular professors doing work that seems good. Uh, I mean, Tom Griffith's lab at Berkeley, um, I think it's the Computational Cognitive Science Lab. I, I might have gotten the name slightly wrong. Um, but but he's doing great work on like uh, studying whether the brain's intuitive decision-making heuristics are optimal under certain con- conditions, and how can we tell? Um, and then there's also Dan Kahan at Yale Law School, uh, who's done a lot of work on, I think his, his lab is called the Cultural Cognition Lab, and he has a blog, um, if you just look, Google Cultural Cognition, you can read a lot of his research. Uh, and that seems like well done and interesting and, uh, and about important topics. Mm. So for the right person, they're potential kind of PhD supervisors or, or mentors, perhaps? Uh, perhaps I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't actually know like don't, what the don't, opportunities don't are. It, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, great. So uh, moving on a little bit, uh, how do you think about your career uh, going forward? Where, where do you think you might be in five or ten years' time? Uh, I would love in five years or ten. Ten years is too. Who knows yeah, yeah. what the world will look like, like in ten years? Back back doing urban engineering, perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> God, maybe I'll be a dentist. I don't know. <laughs> um, I'll have decided uh, uh, social psychology is too unrigorous. I need dentistry. Is really worth that. Um, Precise drilling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but in five years, it, it seems not wholly implausible to me um, that we could have a sort of loose-knit, unofficial community of, you know, 100 people in, like, spanning VC and tech and uh, in the government and the media who are uh, really, like, thoughtful and uh, and curious and have engaged with, like, the 12 most important issues for the future of the world and have like heard the best arguments on both sides and have, you know, revised their views somewhat over time and are taking actions to like acting on those models that they've, you know, forged through this process. Um, to me that, that seems both like plausibly achievable in five years and also like it would be really good for the world. Um, obviously a hundred is a minority, but it's, you know, a hundred of relatively influential people in their different fields um, who influence where funding goes, you know, uh, potentially where, like, which, how lobbying money is spent to influence policy, um, what ideas are being put out into the public discourse. These are really useful things. And so I think people who are in a position to direct those resources and public attention and so on, um, having even a subset of those be uh, have invested time over the course of several years making their models of these topics more accurate um, would be really valuable. So you're involved in both the effective altruism and rationality communities. Mm-hmm. Uh, what kind of mistakes do you think they might be making at the moment? <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a, quite a fan of both of those communities. Mm-hmm. I'll just say off the bat. Um, I think... Well, so, okay, so these mistakes are not universal, but mistakes, things that seem plausibly like mistakes to me that I've seen at least some large subset of those communities making would include um, leaning too heavily or putting too much trust in explicit reasoning, um, which is not to say, like, you know, blind guessing or, or just, like, pure intuition is, is optimal, um, but I think there are certain... Uh, there are certain models like, I don't know, utilitarianism frameworks, I guess, which often give like counterintuitive answers. Um, and I think the rationality and EA communities are, are quite good compared to most of the world at saying like, okay, well, just cause it feels counterintuitive doesn't mean it's wrong. And like the logic, this is what the logic spits out. And so, you know, we should really take that seriously. And I think that's great. I think the world needs a lot more of that. But at the same time, if something feels counterintuitive or suspicious or it feels maybe, I don't know, sketchy or like it might have ethical concerns around it or something, um, I think those you should take those concerns seriously too. 
and uh, try to interrogate like what seems wrong about this. Um, you know, is this? I guess I just I don't want people to lean too heavily or too completely on any one explicit reasoning framework. Um, I thought that uh, I thought that Paul Cristiano did a good job in a recent blog post, which I don't know, maybe you can link to. We can to. link to. Great. Yeah. Um, I think he called it integrity for consequentialists. Mm. And I don't know exactly what his trajectory was of landing at this view. But basically, um, this is the kind of thing that I think uh, can happen sometimes if you allow yourself to be suspicious of some of the sketchy or like counterintuitive conclusions of a framework like utilitarianism. You can say like, well, gee, it sort of seems maybe bad to have people like breaking promises to each other if they think that's the concept, the like utilitarian thing to do. Um, and that's like a fork in the road where on the one hand you can say, oh, well, it's the utilitarian thing and then just do it. Or you can say like, hmm, this seems maybe bad. Let me think some more and like see if I should be revising this model somehow. Um, and I think Paul's post integrity for consequentialists is a really nice, like elegant revision of a standard utilitarian model um, that I think works better. It's probably not perfect, but it's, and it's the kind of thing that you won't come to if you just sort of like trust the logic of your current framework, even if it feels wrong. Hmm. Um, so yeah, uh, putting, putting more weight on like stuff seeming weird or being uncomfortable with conclusions is like one potential hmm. thing I would advise. Um, and then I guess it's not clear to me. It seems plausible to me that it might be a mistake for the EA community to be trying to grow um, and do as much outreach, sorry, to grow as fast and do as much outreach as it is doing. Um, I, it seems to me like the EA, so if the EA community was more like a political movement, then, uh, then that would seem good. Uh, political movements need money and they need votes and you can, and sort of anyone can give money and votes. And so you want to get as many new people in as possible. Um, but there's this other end of the spectrum that's more like a, a like scientific community mm. or something, and and you don't want to just like add as many people as you can to the scientific community of anyone who you know wants to join. You want to like keep the epistemic standards and the quality of discussion really high, mm. and so you have to be more selective about who you add. Um, and I think EA is like somewhere in between those two poles, mm. uh, and you know. It's not obvious to me what the right answer is in terms of like how fast should, to scale should we up. Should be but more elitist or yeah, more basically, broad, yeah. basically. So it, mm. you know, it, it may be a mistake. I, yeah. I might, upon more reflection, careful consideration, think it's a mistake um, to grow as fast as we are trying to grow. Yeah. Interesting. I um I read that post by Paul Cristiano. It's oh, really yeah. good. So I'll, so yeah, I'll, so I'll good, definitely right? I'll definitely link to it. Yeah. I guess um. I guess I haven't noticed that many people, you know, uh, you know, being dishonest or, or betraying one another in, in that kind of way. But maybe I, I, I only interact with well, people who, you know, I who I trust, which is kind of <laughs> the point that, you know, if you behave poorly, then people are just not going to want to be around you. So I've chosen the people who I work with and the people who I'm friends with, uh, like carefully chosen to be very, you know, trustworthy, reasonable yeah. people. So Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I think there are strategic arguments in favor mm-hmm. of. Uh, of integrity and keeping mm. promises even when it's not locally utilitarian mm. or it doesn't seem locally utilitarian. Um, and so I think to some extent, I mean, to be clear, I haven't seen a ton of this, you know, of like actual promise breaking. I've seen mm. a little bit of it. Mm. It's not clear to me, like the world in general, mm. <laughs> like is often dishonest and breaks promises. It's, I, I suspect that the EA community is actually better than the, you know, average level of integrity in the world as a whole. Yeah. Um, so I've seen a little bit of like, I don't know, promise breaking in the name of utilitarianism. Mm. Um, maybe what I've seen more of than that is like people endorsing mm. okay. that as a rule, as opposed to doing it themselves in a way that I was able to perceive. Okay, interesting. Maybe we can talk about that um, more another time. So, what do you think is the biggest downside of the career path that you've that you've taken? Mm, the biggest, I mean, one downside is just lack of certainty like if you if you have a more well-defined career track like let's say you go into academia and you get tenure or you uh become a doctor and you have a practice or you you know become a lawyer and you become a partner etc um there's some stability there and some certainty about what things will look like for you 10 or 15 years down the road um and i don't quite have that 
I feel like I've built up some, uh, some security just through like diversity, like uh, the kind of stability that comes from robustness Mm -hmm. where I have like sort of a number of different irons in the fire. And, you know, maybe if one of them doesn't work out, I can like ramp up the others or it won't be completely catastrophic. Um, because I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket. So I've tried to build in some robustness that way. Yeah. But it is definitely, you know, I am kind of figuring it out as I go along. Mm. And that's just something that's going to be true anytime you do something that doesn't have a standard template. Yeah. Um, someone uh, who I was speaking to uh, for another episode earlier today was saying that it's a lot easier to do that when you have a partner who's able to, you know, potentially financially support you if you need to run your own project. And I guess you've, you know, potentially, I guess you were leaning on your parents earlier in your life. Yeah, um, right after that, I left grad school. Yeah. yeah. Is that kind of true that, uh, well, if you have like money in the bank or if you have, yeah, if you have a runway, then that, it's a lot easier to uh, it does kind of make take it these easier. career risks. It's true. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so are there any things that you could imagine learning in the next few years that could really send you off in a different direction with your career, working on different problems or tackling them in other ways? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think if I, if I updated significantly in favor of one particular global catastrophic risk being imminent Mm -hmm. and likely, um, I might like the the stuff that I'm doing is sort of, it seems to me to be useful and valuable in the medium run, Mm -hmm. uh, and sort of useful, like in expectation across a lot of different possible, like there's no one, you know, useful consequence that I think is likely to result from what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I just sort of think that in general, if we have, you know, influential people and decision makers uh, following thinking and discussing procedures that are correlated with accuracy, Mm. uh, then we get better results in the long run. But that's a very indirect, you know, connection to draw. Um, And it's sort of may not be the best thing to do if there's like one risk that suddenly looms. um, I might just like shift my attention and resources to working on that like one particular risk. Yeah, that makes sense. So we've been at uh, EA Global all day, and I think mm-hmm. we're, we're, we're both pretty hungry, so we should, we should go <laughs> off and get dinner. But uh, one last question is, sure. are, are there any other conferences that you go to uh, regularly where people could, uh, I guess, potentially meet you or, or like network with other people if they're interested in working on the same kind of topics? Oh, um, well, I mean, one conference that I have been going to every year is the Northeast Conference on Science and Skepticism, mm. uh, which is sort of like my roots uh, it was the origin of the podcast and, you know, thereby the origin of my current career trajectory. Uh, it's in New York every year and it's run by, uh, basically the skeptic community. So, uh, there's some overlap between the skeptics and, you know, the rationalists or EAs. Um, they tend to focus on, uh, like evidence and scientific knowledge and scientific literacy and education and things like that. And they don't talk, they don't tackle the same kinds of questions that EA or the rationality community does. They're not quite as focused on like what is the biggest sort of most important impactful thing that there is to figure out. Um, and they're uh, maybe somewhat more focused on like just promoting the sort of consensus view in a scientific field against, you know, misinformation or pseudoscience or, um, or like fraud, mm. uh, which I think is also valuable. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's in New York every year. I, I tend to do a live podcast taping at Nexus every year. Uh, and so you can, um, you can check out information about the previous Nexus. And then uh, as we get closer to the next one, it'll have information about buying tickets and so on. It's uh, necss.org. Great. Well, uh, my guest today has been Julia Galef. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Julia. My pleasure. This has been fun, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> hope you enjoyed that episode once again you can get personalized one-on-one coaching free to help you work on the same kinds of problems that julia is by applying on the eighty thousand hours website the link is in the blog post or the episode show notes if you enjoyed that episode we have much more where that came from uh, you can subscribe and see all the episodes that we have out and keep track of new ones by searching for eighty thousand hours in your podcasting app It would also be great if you could let a friend know about the show or rate us on iTunes. Thanks for listening. Speak to you next week.